1969 was a time of turmoil in our country, but the McCabe family kind of defied that, and they were still that nuclear family. John McCabe was 15 years old, and he went to a dance. John got to the dance, but he never came home. For many years, finding out what happened to John was a mystery. The case had gone cold. The McCabe family never gave up. They wanted answers. The DA called us and said each one of them was arrested. And it felt as though finally some justice would be served. Nineteen sixty nine was a seminal year in American history. Richard Nixon had been voted into office as the thirty seventh president. And while the United States government was embroiled in a war abroad, Americans were fighting with each other at home. In the midst of all of this upheaval, a fifteen year old boy named John McCabe's biggest challenge was attending his first high school dance. What followed was a mystery spanning over forty years that left the McCabe family and many people in the town of Tewksbury, Massachusetts, looking over their shoulders. Tewksbury, Massachusetts in 1969 was an idyllic place, a working class town filled with families and uh, moms and dads uh, who are working to support their kids, a uh, very Irish Catholic. In that time, people enjoyed a simpler life. They enjoyed being home at dinner. They enjoyed their vacations. They just enjoyed being together. Tewksbury, Massachusetts, especially back in 1969, would have been considered a small, quaint New England town. A nice town and quiet, where crime really wasn't something that you saw a lot of. Everybody hung out with each other. So if you didn't know someone, the next day you'd meet them. This is one of the towns that everybody knew what everybody else was doing. You felt safe leaving your doors open. You felt safe walking to school, walking to the market, wherever you were going. It felt like home to everybody. Nineteen sixty-nine was a time of turmoil in our country. The nineteen fifties were long gone. The sixties were almost over, and now we're going into the seventies. Things were changing. But the McCabe family seems like a family that kind of defied that, and they were still that nuclear family who just enjoyed being together. John McCabe was 15 years old. He lived with his mom and dad and his two sisters. It was like normal parents. Dad would go to work. He'd come home from work, go to his favorite chair and read the paper, watch the news. Mom would cook dinner. He'd say, don't disturb me, I'm watching the news. <laughs> Johnny would do homework. Well, mom would yell at him to do homework, I should say. There's a picture of them taken at the beach. You can see in that picture how happy they are just to be together. Back then, when you took a picture with a camera, you only got one shot. And in that one shot, you see everyone smiling. They're happy. They're happy to be together. John McCabe was a 15-year-old young man who seemed to be an all-American boy. He was a bit of a prankster. He liked to joke around with his sisters and his parents. He was a high school kid. He was coming through adolescence and looking forward to the future, but he also liked to get his hands dirty. He liked to go out into the woods, use his imagination. He'd call me his little brat sister. I was six. I was always sticking my nose into whatever he was doing, just hanging around. I remember John always doing something in the garage, always constructing something, either a lawnmower or trying to fix one or putting together a dirt bike or mom and dad yelling at him to go deliver his papers or to stop passing around with me. So it was kind of like leave it to Beaver. What we know is on that night, John McCabe wanted to go to a dance at the Knights of Columbus, and this was a big deal for him. He had to ask his mother for permission to go to the dance. John begged and begged and begged to go. He wasn't being forced to go. He wanted to go, all the kids were going. It was the first dance, first one that he had ever been to. It was a Friday night, gonna be a lot of people at this dance, gonna be a lot of pretty girls, and John wanted to be there. So he put on his best clothes, put on some aftershave, combed his hair, made sure he looked great. John McCabe didn't have a car, so he just walked to the dance. The dance went to about 11 o'clock. At midnight, John was still not home. 
So his mother was waiting up for him. She knew something was wrong when he wasn't home by midnight. She knew how long it would take to go from the Knights of Columbus back to their house. Joan was supposed to be home sometime after the dance, and he never returned. A murder in which the victim is hogtied, his mouth is taped shut, and his eyes are taped shut, is something that only happens in mob movies. It doesn't happen in a nice town like Tewksbury. 2-4. On the night of September 26, 1969, 15-year-old John McCabe attended his first high school dance at the Knights of Columbus Hall in Tewksbury, Massachusetts. Although John was supposed to be home after the dance ended at 11 p.m., it is now past midnight and he's nowhere in sight. John's mother, Evelyn, frantic with worry, drives the streets of town calling out his name. John McCabe's mother knew how long it would take to walk from the Knights of Columbus Hall to their house, and by midnight, John wasn't home, so she went out and went looking for him. She got in the car and drove through the area. She drove by the Knights of Columbus. She's calling her son's name and does not get an answer. That mother's intuition was 100% correct. She knew that something was radically wrong. And it wasn't until the next day that they got a visit from the police. There were little kids that found John uh, the next morning in a vacant lot. They had actually flagged down a police officer and they told the, the officer they discovered John's body. His body was tied up, his wrists were bound together, his ankles were bound together. His ankles were attached to his neck by a rope and he also had tape over his eyes and over his mouth. And then all kinds of cars pulled in. Um, there was a priest, there was a police officer and my dad, and just my mother keeling over when they said something to her. And then they repeated it. They said, Johnny's gone, Johnny's dead. My mother was so upset, dad was crying and hugging her. I went into Johnny's room on his bed and I just kept crying. Somebody came in to talk to me. It was either the priest or one of the police officers to come in and tell me it would, it's okay, it's okay, is all they kept saying. I actually said, no, it's not okay, he's not coming back. In a place like Tewksbury, if a young person dies, it's probably in a car accident or something along those lines. Murder is something that just does not happen in a small town like Tewksbury. A murder in which the victim is hogtied his mouth is taped shut and his eyes are taped shut is something that only happens in mob movies. It doesn't happen in a nice town like Tewksbury. John was abducted. When he left the dance, he was driven to our city, Lowell, Massachusetts, and he was bound and he was left in a lot uh, where he strangled to death as a result of how he had been tied. The detectives thought there may be some involvement by Walter Shelley and Michael Ferreira. Mike Ferreira and Walter Shelley were very close friends. They were a little bit older than John McCabe was, but they were known for being rambunctious. My parents didn't really recognize them other than somebody had said something once that they were trouble and that John didn't hang out with them. They were all in high school together, but as the case moved on, Walter and Michael were doing everything they could to distance themselves and say, I didn't really know him. I, I don't know anything about him. They had always been considered suspects. And you don't have any clue where he was? No. no, no they were interviewed back in 1969. They were given polygraphs back in 1969. They allegedly performed polygraph tests on Walter, which he failed. A couple people came forward in the days after the murder. Some reported seeing a 1965 maroon Chevy Impala in Lowell around the time that John's body would have been dropped in that vacant lot. Walter Shelley drove a 1965 maroon Chevrolet Impala. But they were unable to come up with any physical evidence to tie these two men to the crime. Mm -hmm. 
For many years, finding out what happened to John was a mystery. The case had gone cold. He didn't want to go anywhere. Didn't want to do anything. You just kind of like living in a bubble. It made us kind of paranoid of other people. Never knowing who it could be. Could it be someone next to me at the grocery store? That's what my mother always said. Dad always wondering who, why, why no answers after all this time. It was sad because in speaking with them, you could see the anguish that they lived with, that never went away, that never healed. And as a result of that, it changed how they lived their lives. They didn't joke around at all. I think dad felt that it was his fault for agreeing to let him go to the dance. Mom and dad were getting old. I wanted something to happen. I said, I'm gonna write up a letter to one of the television shows. I can't even remember who I sent it to. And I called dad. I said, dad, what do you think about this? I read it to him. And I said, I'm gonna CC the Lowell police, the Tewksbury police. So I sent the letter and I want to say within a week or so, Lowell Police Department called me back. One of the officers said to me that they had gotten my letter. They were starting to review the case. Uh, I get chills. Suddenly it was out in the Lowell Sun on the front page. Unsolved murder mystery reopened. And picture of my brother. I don't believe what I'm seeing. Stuff started moving again. Ferreira and Shelly are claiming they picked up this brown guy. Why didn't we ever question him? It was completely unbelievable. And he failed on every aspect of it. Over $27,000 worth of stolen reptiles. And a teenager fatally shot. William Zelensky, owner of Wild Bill's Exotic, stands accused of killing his girlfriend's son. The alleged motive, snakes and a crocodile stolen from the defendant. We're taking you inside the courtroom as this shocking case unfolds. The Stolen Reptile Murder Trial. Live coverage starting Monday morning at 8, 7 central on Court TV. After years of sitting on the shelf at the Lowell Police Department, the investigation files and evidence boxes of the 1969 murder of John McCabe are being dusted off. All thanks to the dogged persistence of his family, who never gave up on bringing his killer to justice. This case went completely ice cold from 1969 until the turn of the century. At the beginning, the cops started asking around, where was John that night? Who was he with? And it didn't take them long to find out that he was with Mike Ferrara that night. Mike Ferrara and Nancy Williams admitted that they saw him walking and they gave him a ride to the dance. And then they dropped him off and didn't see him again later that night. Jack Ward was a boyhood friend of John McCabe, and Ward remained friends with uh, John McCabe's father. Jackie Ward, he was over to come visit, and he'd say, you know, Mr. McCabe, I'm always keeping an eye out for anybody says anything, I'm always out there listening for you and keep my eye out. And then suddenly, once after a cookout, he heard something at the cookout. He shocked my father. Dad was like, oh, we gotta call the police. Jack Ward reported to police that uh, there had been a cookout at a, a mutual friend's house, and Ward reported that Michael Ferreira approached him during the cookout and said to Jack Ward, Ferreira said, I know who killed John McCabe. It was Walter Shelley, and it was jealousy over Marla Shiner. Walter Shelley was dating Marla, and he was 17 or 18. But at the time, Marla was only 13 years old, which puts her in middle school or junior high school and Walter's in high school. Supposedly, what was said, I don't know how true it was, that Johnny thought she was cute. So all I thought about years after that was my brother was closer in age, and he might have said she was cute. And maybe Walter took offense, and it upset him. The talk around town was that John was killed by Mike Ferreira 
and Walter Shelley due to John making passes at Marla Shiner. This was supposedly a jealousy attack, and according to those that were around Mike and Walter, they intended to intimidate and assault John. The murder was not the ultimate plan, but that's what happened. Sometime around 2007, the administration in the Lowell Police Department Criminal Bureau, where I'm assigned, had asked me to take up the McCabe case. My mother convinced me to believe that this, this one was finally going to do it. All the other police officers were men, so maybe my mother just figured a, a new set of hands, a new police officer that's a female is going to do it. And she did. We continued to look at all avenues and, and who could have possibly been responsible for this. And then somewhere around 2011, Edward Allen Brown came into the scene. So Edward Allen Brown was never interviewed back in 1969. And he was very good friends with Michael Ferrer and Walter Shelley, and that the three of them always hung out together. But ironically, I think he may have only been mentioned once in a police report back in 69. And for whatever reason, it was never really followed up on. Ferreira and Shelley are claiming they picked up this brown guy. Why didn't we ever question him? And then he was finally questioned. She brought Alan in for questioning, and he said that he knew nothing about the murder. Which right off the bat, in a small town like Tewksbury, if he went to high school at the time that one of his classmates was murdered, then he would have known the story at a minimum. To hear Edward Allen Brown say, yeah, I never heard of him, it was completely unbelievable. He was administered the polygraph test, and he failed on every aspect of it. The police said, listen, if you don't help us, you're going to be up on some serious charges here. And after he agreed to a manslaughter deal and to testify against the other guys. But in the end, what he told us was that he got picked up by Walter Shelley and Michael Ferreira that night. When he got into Walter's 1965 maroon Chevy Impala, he was told that they were going to send a message to John McCabe for flirting with Marla Shiner. They wanted to scare him. So they went out looking for him, and they found him. Brown says that as they're driving around, that it's Ferrara who sees John McCabe on the side of the road, and he says, there he is. And they pulled over to the side of the road, and they dragged him into the car. He was forced into the back seat with Edwin Allen Brown, who held him while Michael Ferrara assaulted him, hitting him, slapping him. He told us that John was crying and begging to be let out of the car. They drove to Lowell. They ended up in that vacant lot on Maple Street. Alan would say that Mike and Walter and Alan all got out of the car with John. And at that point, Mike and Walter began assaulting John. They all hold him down. They grab rope. They take that rope, they wrap it around John's legs, around his ankles, up around his hands. Another rope, or the same piece of rope, it's not clear, wrapped around his neck, all tied together. Somebody takes tape and puts it across John's mouth, and more tape and puts it over John's eyes. And they say, leave Marla alone. This is what you get. This is what you get. Leave Marla alone. And they get in the car and they leave John McCabe there. Brown says they drive around for an hour and a half, maybe two hours, drinking. Alan says he suggested that they go back and check on John and to set him free, but when they returned to John's body, he was already dead. If they all would have come forward in the very beginning and said, listen, it was an accident gone wrong, a prank like they originally said, and it wasn't. If it was, they, they all would have come forward. They tied his neck, they taped his mouth, he had no way to breathe. I think it was the DA called us and said we had to go to the police department because we had to sit down for a meeting. So they let us know that every one of them was arrested at a different place, a different time. 
My dad pretty much laid his head and arms down on the table, crying. Uh, Debbie and I were trying to console him and mom. And just to think that something, something finally has happened for the good. A general question was asked, I wonder who really did kill him? Yes. Was there a response from anyone in the car? Yes, Michael. What did Michael say? He said he did it. Love watching free TV? Yes. There's a world of premium programming available right at your fingertips. All you need to do is rescan your television using a digital antenna. Then enjoy a lineup of 24 hour news and entertainment channels. I'm kind of loving this. To learn how to rescan your TV, visit thefreetvproject.org. More than four decades after 15-year-old John McCabe was found dead, the Lowell Police Department arrested Michael Ferreira and Walter Shelley for his murder. That was due in large part to the cooperation of Edward Allen Brown, who took a plea deal in exchange for testifying against his friends. Although both men were charged with murder, the state tried them separately, with Ferreira facing a jury first. September 27, 1969, a Saturday morning. Two young boys were cut through a field by the rail yards in Lowell off of Maple Street on their way to catch some frogs. While walking across the field, they spotted a young boy. He was bound, hand and foot, rope around the neck, face down. It was the body of John McCabe. This trial is about how John McCabe reached that point. And the evidence will show it was based upon jealousy. Jealousy by Walter Shelley, because supposedly John McCabe was flirting with his 13-year-old girlfriend, Marla Shana. Initially, Michael Ferreira and Walter Shelley were both charged with murder, but because of how the law was in 1969, they had to be charged accordingly from the law in 1969. So Michael was charged as a juvenile. John McCabe died, left his family, he left his friends, and he left this world. Cold cases don't get better with memories. Cold cases get better either with science or facts that cannot change over 43 years. And that's what this case will be all about. The trial strategy uh, for Michael Ferreira's trial was to expose the jury to lack of investigation, to establish that Alan Brown could not be relied upon by a jury. The other part of my strategy, I wanted to take the Ferreira case to trial first, and based on experience, uh, if the prosecution team gets the trial of the co-defendant, they fix mistakes, and I did not want to be the second trial where the Commonwealth would have a second bite at the apple. Jerry Wayne and Lieutenant Sullivan in 2007 go to visit Alan Brown. And Alan Brown is questioned. What do you know about <coughs> the John McKay murder in 1969? I don't know anything about it. Yeah, I was friends with Shelley. Yeah, I was friends with Ferrer, but I don't remember anything about it. And that was it. End of the interview. Edward Allen Brown seems to come from out of nowhere. It turns out he was an incredibly significant player in all of this, but he kept quiet all these years. Two years ago, February 17th, 2011, they questioned Allen Brown. Allen Brown, consistent with his memory four years before, to Lieutenant Sullivan and Detective Coughlin, I don't remember anything. And the police tell him, you've got to remember something. And then Allen Brown, on March 2nd, tells the police, Listen, you guys are telling me I'm involved. You're telling me I'm lying. You guys are accusing me of murder. He starts to tell the police, maybe I was involved. And I have repressed memory. In 2011, Detective Linda Coughlin administered a polygraph test on Alan Brown. And when he failed it and she delivered that news to him, he confessed everything that he knew about this crime. There are a lot of cases that we come upon that you never forget. John was such a young boy and this family was so impacted. The thing that was always 
In the forefront, though, was the McCabe family. They never, ever gave up. Both Mr. McCabe, his wife Evelyn, they never gave up. They always pushed. They wanted answers. Mr. McCabe was the true hero uh, for the decades that uh, following his son's death. He would not let it go. And sir, did you have children in 1969? Yes. How many? Three. Boys or girls? I had two girls and one boy. And what was the boy's name? Boy's name is John J. McCabe. Do you recognize that photo? Yeah. Who's in that photo? That's our son. John J. McCabe? John J. McCabe, yeah. It felt good because John's death had gone unanswered for such a length of time. There were statements from three individuals that Michael had admitted to killing John McCabe. I think one came in at trial. The others were not allowed to. Please spell your last name. So we went with what, what the court allowed. You had a conversation with Michael about the John McCabe investigation, correct? Correct. Do you have a memory of Michael saying that day, that Sunday, the police thought he did it? Correct. Was he asked, why do the police think you did it? I asked him why he thought the police... And did he answer? Yes. What did he say? He said because he didn't have an alibi for that day. And then a general question was asked, I wonder who really did kill him? Yes. Do you remember saying that? I remember saying that. Was there a response from anyone in the car? Yes, Michael. What did Michael say? He said he did it. I can't remember who said it, but somebody said cut it out or something to that nature. And was that mentioned to him? Did Michael say or do anything? Yeah. What did he do? He looked back and said, huh, just kidding. And today in front of this jury, you happen to remember a conversation that you were too impaired to remember in 97, right? That, that's correct. I know they were both probably drinking, but why would he lie? Nobody ever plans to end up in a room like this. Everyday people caught up in a plan to commit murder. Did you kill your mother? Yes, I did. The ultimate betrayals, friends and family turning on each other. The spell was broken when the handcuffs went click. But just who is the puppet and who's pulling the strings? Accomplice to Murder with Fanny Politan. All new episode next Sunday night, 8, 7 central. Only on Court TV. There was a total lack of physical evidence tying Michael Ferreira to the death of John McCabe. Prosecutors will have to rely on the testimony of those who knew the defendant all those years ago in order to build their case. Sir, would you state your name, please, and spell your last name? Jack Wilson-Mark, Jr., W-A-I-D. A lifetime happens in 41 years. You go from a high school junior to getting close to retirement. Michael spent time in the Army in Vietnam. Michael worked for decades. And you're close to retirement, and you're now charged with murder. Did you know a person or boy in the neighborhood named John McCabe. Yes, I did. How close were you to John? Close. We're best friends. Jack Ward was a really good friend of John McCabe when they were teenagers. Jack was at a cookout with several of his former high school friends. And at that cookout, he reportedly heard Mike Ferreira tell that he knew who killed John McCabe. While you are there, did Michael Ferreira engage you in a conversation? Yes, he did. Could you describe how that occurred? We were having a normal conversation, and normal, and he said something out of the norm that caught my attention. And what was that? He said to me, I know who killed John McKeg. Did you respond to him? At first, no. <laughs> was an attempt made by Michael Ferrara to reinitiate the conversation? Yes. And what was the second attempt? I know who killed John McKeg. Did you respond to that? No. Did Michael then walk away? He repeated it the third time. Did you respond to it the third yes. time? Yes. What did you say to him? I said, who? 
kill John. He said, Walter, Walter Shelley. What was your response to that? Uh, I said, what would be Walter's motive to do something like that? And he said, Mala, because of Mala. Did you tell someone? Uh, I did, yes. Who'd you tell? Mr. McCabe. He, he shocked my father. My father had to step back from the doorway and sit down. And dad was like, oh, we gotta call the police. Jackie said, well, let me get some more witnesses that heard, because they're not gonna believe just me. And my father was like, no, no, Jackie, you're the, you're the, the main witness in this, because he said it directly to you. Subsequent to that, after you told Mr. McCabe, you were interviewed by state and local police, correct? It was sometime after that, yes. And then years later, you testified at the grand jury about it. Yes, I did. <clears throat> Ten years ago, during this interview with the police that we've been talking about, the only thing that you <coughs> represented to the police <coughs> with respect to what Michael Ferreira said was he made a comment, Walter Shelley killed John McCabe, right? Yes. The theory that it was jealousy over Marla Shiner was your theory, right? Somewhat, yes. You had an epiphany in your mind and said bingo and said, oh, it all came together to me. And that's what you told the police in 2002. It all came together to you, right? Yes. I know they were both probably drinking, but why would he lie? Barrow says, oh yeah, I said it joking around. Jackie was like, no, that was no joke. And so as the barbecue advances, you're drinking, he's drinking, there's a second conversation that's had, right? Yes. And because your state of intoxication, you really don't remember what he said, right? That's correct. Okay. Right. But now, when you talk to Detective Coughlin in 2011, you remember, right? It was brought up. Yeah. Yes. And today, in front of this jury, you happen to remember a conversation that you were too impaired to remember in 97, right? That, that's correct. Marla Shiner uh, was not mentioned at all until Jack Ward went to police and said he had developed a theory. Would you raise your right hand, please? That McCabe was killed over jealousy of Marla Shiner. Miss Shiner, was Walter Shelley a jealous man? Absolutely. From when you first met him, not dating him, first met him, approximately 12 years old, correct? 13. Was he jealous then? <sighs> yes. Did you eventually marry Walter Shelley? Yes. How old were you? 18. Were you dating Walter Shelley at the time? At that time, yes. In fact, you had been dating him since you were 12 years old, correct? I don't believe so. You didn't 13. tell that to the state police over the phone? I don't believe saying okay. that. I don't, I don't recall that. September 26, 1969. Were you dating Walter Shelley? No. Didn't you just answer yes five minutes ago? The day John McCabe died. I was not dating Walter when, when John McCabe died. How often would you say you saw Michael Ferrara? I don't recall. Can you recall anything? Well, 43 years ago is a long time. Mala Shiner acted like she had nothing to do with it, wanted nothing to do with it, and gave very little input. I'm going to ask you if you can recall the night, September 26, 1969. Do you remember that day? Yes. What were you doing in that evening time period? I was at home watching uh, television, and at about 10.30, they came by to pick me up to go out. Who's they? Walter and Michael. They wanted me to go with them to help them. And we started driving, and they said they wanted to go uh, find this kid that had been uh, flirting and, met, you know, messing around with Marla to teach him a lesson. Prior to going in to meet with Detective Linda Coughlin, you had been questioned a couple of times at that point, right? Yes. You were under a great deal of stress at that point, weren't you? Yes. Okay. You thought before that meeting you had been told you were involved in this multiple times, right? Yes. They were telling you you were involved, you were denying your involvement, right? Yes. And you were told the DA could help you out, right? Yes. And then that's in part why you changed your story, right? Yes. The trial rose or fell based on the believability or lack of believability of Alan Brown. 
and my focus on cross-examination was to discredit his testimony, to use his own prior statements that were not consistent with his trial testimony to the jury to show that Brown had lied under oath before. You remember on Friday I asked you some questions when Mr. O'Reilly in front of the grand jury asked you whether there was a rope around his neck. Do you remember saying, I don't know why there'd be a rope around his neck, there was no rope around his neck? Yes. Okay. You later said that you lied to the grand jury because you were afraid. I didn't say I lied. I, I was afraid, but I didn't say I lied. So, because you were afraid, you didn't tell the grand jury something specifically asked about a rope around the neck. That's yes. your story now? Yes. So fear drives what, you, what your story is, isn't it? To some degree. Yes. I will say this. Michael had a fabulous attorney. Eric Wilson was a fabulous attorney, and he did a very good job. Eric took him apart. He absolutely did. And I think at that point, you know, after two days of testimony and, and you know, getting these verbal punches, all he wanted to do was get out of there. And so he started just agreeing to everything. Madam Four Lady, on indictment 2011, charging this defendant, Michael Ferreira, with murder in the first degree, what say you to this indictment, ma'am? Is the defendant guilty or not guilty? cases based entirely on circumstantial evidence are difficult to prove. Memories fade, witnesses die, and the truth becomes cluttered with inconsistencies and false information. For defense counsel Eric Wilson, the task at hand is to remind the jury of those weaknesses in the state's case. For prosecutor Tom O'Reilly, the goal is to push past those deficits and connect with the jury on a human level, reminding them of who John was and the brutal death he endured. The sorrow for the McCabe family cannot be evaluated. It just is tragic. This case, without question, was a cold case for over 40 years. Um, but cold cases don't get solved over improved memories. Cold cases get solved with facts. They get solved with science, and they get solved with what you've heard about that was found right there in that field that morning. You simply cannot believe Edward Allen Brown based on his promise that he's going to tell you the truth. He has disregarded it, and I believe I showed you that so many times. And if he were truly involved in this, these are things he has to know, but he doesn't. What I explained to the jury uh, in my closing is that there was no question that the McCabe family have suffered for decades and they still suffered, but the prosecution of Michael Ferreira could not answer the questions. 15-year-old boy, John McCabe, lying on his stomach in the middle of a deserted field. His eyes have tape on him so he can't see. His mouth is gagged with tape so he can't yell. His feet are tied. His hands are tied behind his back. There's a rope around his neck to his feet. In every attempt to move, renders unconsciousness a little closer. The last words he hears, that will teach you to not mess with Mala. Everyone's memory, as counsel said, goes down a bit over 40 something years. And people make stupid damn mistakes when they're 16, 17 years old. They do intentional acts, not thinking of consequences. But the acts they did do, They did kill John McCabe. That's not an accident. That's not a make-believe. That's putting a rope around your neck, tying it so tight you can't breathe. But you're responsible for your actions. Mr. Brown has accepted that responsibility. And I'd ask this jury to have Mr. Ferrer responsible for his actions. Thank you. When a jury goes out, it can be excruciating. I saw how it was for the McCabe family. It was excruciating for them.
and I was anxious. It's almost like, okay, this is the moment. This is what we've been waiting for. The verdict was announced um, Friday morning. I think the jury may have deliberated three or four hours in total. Has the jury agreed upon its verdict? Yes. Madam Four Lady, on indictment 2011, 793, count one, charging this defendant, Michael Ferreira, with murder in the first degree. What say you to this indictment, ma'am? Is the defendant guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Members of the jury, you will hearken to your verdict as recorded by the court. The jurors, upon their oath, do find Michael Ferreira not guilty. So say you, Madam Four Lady? Yes. And so say you, all members of this jury? Yes. yes. You may be seated. The verdict of Michael Ferreira and not getting charged with murder and life in prison. I just, I didn't believe it. I thought something had gone wrong. The verdict of not guilty was a tremendous r relief to Mike. At that point, the, he had been awaiting trial for uh, close to two years. So a tremendous amount of stress to know if a jury convicts you that you will spend the rest of your life in prison. No doubt in my mind that they are the people responsible for John's death. Michael Walter and Edward Allen Brown, no doubt whatsoever. Dad wasn't feeling good. He was too, too weak to come into the courtroom and hear it. They had already got the news and sent it right through to him. We got to the room and he was just bawling, horrible. Couldn't stop crying. When Bill McCabe found out that Mike Ferreira had been found not guilty of murder, he really went into a spiral physically and ultimately passed away shortly thereafter. He had put his entire life into finding justice for his son, and when he finally thought that somebody was going to be held accountable and they weren't, he couldn't handle it. So now Evelyn has lost her son and her husband to this case of trying to get justice for John's death. That's why my mother and Debbie and I decided we have to go forward and prove that Walter Shelley, Michael Ferreira, and Edward Allen Brown did this. Six months after uh, the Ferreira trial, the Commonwealth brought Walter Shelley to trial in the early fall of 2013. With Walter Shelley, it was basically an identical trial with a different jury. The difference, I think the prosecution decided we're going to let Edward Allen Brown tell his story and be done with it. At the end of that trial, Walter Shelley was convicted. And I think that that brought a sense of justice to the remaining members of the McCabe family. I try to be positive on... 99% of the time, like with my kids. And the only thing is, I don't trust strangers. Um, I overspoil my kids. I try to enjoy them when they're around because if they weren't here, I'd probably be very depressed, like my mom and dad were. They could have ended this family's anguish 40 years before. They could have altered this family's life in such a way and given them peace, but they didn't choose to do that. They chose to live their lives, pretending that it never happened. And you can't erase John McCabe. You can't. In 2014, Walter Shelley was convicted of first-degree murder in the death of John McCabe. Two years later, a judge would reduce that charge to second-degree murder because the evidence pointed to the lesser charge. Shelley will be eligible for parole in the year 2029. I'm Tamron Hall. Thanks for watching Someone They Knew.